This is, I think this is going to be the biggest one. I think this is bigger than St. Francis. There's also press here, so I think press are taking up some space. Well, There's a lot of press. Well, I'm just wondering too, because St. Francis is a bigger room. Like the numbers still look Maybe. Did they give us punch? This is a test for the live stream. Anyone that's here that wants to share the live stream, you can see it on the Alliance of the Southeast Facebook page. This is a test for audio with the live stream. Alliance of the Southeast Facebook page. You can share it. Take out your phones. <laughs> Consume México. Consume México. I just want to announce something. Good evening again, everyone. Thank you again for being so on time and so plentiful. I know some of you are standing up because we've run out of chairs in this room. We have an overflow room in which we'll be streaming what is going on in here. So if you'd like to sit down and sit comfortably, we have another room just a few steps away that you can go and actually watch it live streaming. If you'd like to do that, please make your way to the door and we'll take you over there. Hola, gracias a todos por esperar con tanta calma. Um, como se pueden dar cuenta, tenemos a más personas de lo que pensamos que íbamos a tener. Pero si no tienen un asiento, tenemos otro cuarto donde vamos a estar um, pasando esto en vivo. Si gustan pasar a ese cuarto donde pueden sentarse, por favor diríjanse hacia la puerta a mi lado, bueno, a su lado izquierdo, um, y ahí los veremos. Gracias. Five to seven minutes for introduction. Five to seven minutes. I want you to nod yes. his head if you could nod your head. Yes. If you could. He wants to make sure you could see. How are you? Five to seven minutes. Introduction. Okay. One minute for platform. One minute and thirty seconds for each answer. And I one think we'll have. One minute for audience have, questions. And one minute for audience questions. And then one minute for closing. One minute closing. Viva el 10th Ward. Minute for introduction? Is that accurate? What? I saw this. That's, that's what the gentleman, gentleman was telling. We asked him. So unless something we should clear that. I don't think that's yeah. true. If, yeah, it's, 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 I think, yeah, double check. I asked Sam. I can't remember who I asked Sam Crony. He said five to seven minutes. Oh, my hair's falling apart. I guess I'll just put it in a braid. Hey, look. I get tired. I don't see the back of my head that much. It's one minute? I mean, that's... Oh. Wait, that's... Oh, did you say a different... Oh, I thought you said one minute, too. Yeah, it's one minute. Yeah. It's one minute? Okay. Let's get to know now. Buenas noches, las personas que están utilizando traducción en español, por favor, levanten su mano, porque estamos probando ahorita el sonido. Las personas que estén utilizando traducción, ¿pueden escuchar? This is my truce. I'm talking to you.
a note for everyone that's up here. Uh, sorry to bother, just going to give the announcement one more time. If you are looking to sit, we do have an overflow room. Uh, please head to the door and Sara, who's raising her hand, will take you there. Um, this is your last call. Um, then una vez más, si gustan sentarse y no tienen silla, por favor diríjanse hacia Sara, que tiene la mano levantada acá con la camisa roja, y los llevará a un cuarto donde estamos pasando en vivo el foro y pueden sentarse ahí. Gracias. <laughs> where you, I should practice beforehand. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> test, test. Yeah, test, test. Is that good? What a, what a, see, see. Testing <laughs> them. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the 10th Candidate Forum in South Chicago, uniting our voice, our vote, our power. My name is Linda Brito, and I am a senior organizer for Centro de Trabajadores Unidos, the United Workers Center, um, which is a community group that has deep roots in the southeast side of Chicago, advancing immigrant and worker rights for over 15 years. We are super, super excited to be here with you all today, and we are just going to make a quick announcement about interpretation. Si ocupan traducción en español, por favor, vayan atrás a recibir el equipo que necesitan para interpretación. Y buenas noches. Good evening, everyone. My name is Crystal. Mi nombre es Cristal. I am the program manager for the SSA5. Soy manejo aquí un programa para apoyar los negocios de la comercial. And it is incredible to see everyone so excited for local debates and local politics because this is how we help our community grow. And es un, es un gran honor de ver todos aquí que estén tan interesados en ayudar a crecer este barrio. And so, um, Without much more, we would like to introduce Angela Herlock, hostess of this wonderful space. So a grand applause for Angela. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Salud Center. We are so excited to have you here. If you've been a part of South Chicago for a long time, you know that this used to be the old YMCA. It is now a brand new community center. If you want to come and work out, we have $70,000 worth of Peloton equipment that you can work out in the basement for free. This is for our community. We are super excited. We have a teen drop-in center. We have a computer lab. We have offices. Uh, we have a co-working space. We're super excited to have you here. We're super excited for tonight because this is where we hear who is going to be our next alder person. Super excited to have you. Um, if you need to go to the restrooms, they're right behind you in the hallway. And so let's just let the, the evening begin. <laughs> I'm sorry, one more thing. If you parked in the parking lot under the building, please move your car because you will be towed. Thank you. Thank you, Angela. Um, this event is sponsored by the following community institutions. Please hold your applause till the end. Um, Alliance of the Southeast, Bridges Puentes, Special Service Area Number 5, Centro de Trabajadores Unidos, the United Workers Center, uh, Clarion Associates, Coalition for a South Works CBA, Family Rescue, Metropolitan Family Services, South Chicago, Pilgrim Missionary Baptist Church, Southeast Environmental Task Force, and the Southeast Youth Alliance. 
But more importantly, you have Latino and African American voters who came from various parts of the 10th Ward and surrounding areas to listen to candidates speak on the issues that directly impact us. Okay, so to get into the fun, we have some ground rules for the candidates and for this forum. Um, and also, again, to repeat, si necesitan traducción, levanten la mano, vayan allá atrás, tenemos audífonos, si alguien va a estar traduciendo así a tiempo real. One, two, one, there we go. Great. So, some candidate rules. Respect our timekeeper. We'll get into what the, our timekeeper, but he's right here in front. You can give a round of applause for now. <laughs> Respect the other candidates. No jeering, no insults, no lying. We all know each other here too, so we'll know. Um, no partisan applause, hooting, hollering, uh, stomping, uh, whistling, no whistling, uh, for your, from your volunteers or from your, for those who you support. No electioneering inside the Salud Center, so no posters, no banners, right? Um, don't go over your time or the microphone will be turned off. You'll get a warning again. We'll explain the timekeeper in a minute. Um, and that's for the candidates. For our great audience, we ask you to please right now silence your phones <laughs> um, because that will help everything go by smoothly. So please silence your cell phones. Again, same thing with the applause and with the jeering and the whistling and the stomping. Hold it till the end. <laughs> um, no yelling, uh, please. <laughs> uh, bathrooms, they're right behind you. So once you step outside here, they're like right behind those gray doors. So they're very nearby. Respect everyone present. We are a community. And again, no campaign buttons or literature to be passed out inside of this building. Um, when you came in, you may have received an index card, some index cards. These are for uh, questions from the audience. So if you already know what your question is, you can write it down now. We have a, we'll be sending around a basket, a blue basket there, where you can start dropping in your questions. It'll be circulating. Or you can wait till the end to see if your question has been answered. So if you all have your index cards, please use them. We will be taking questions from the audience. And... Oh, for those online, hello online, we are live streaming. Let your friends, family know we are live streaming. So if they couldn't make it, they can find us on Alliance of the Southeast Facebook. And so we will also be taking questions from the internet world. So also write down your questions, put them in the chat. We'll really appreciate it. And with that, um, I will pass it on to Lydia. <laughs> How are we feeling, everybody? Yeah, como se sienten todos? Yeah. Um, today, present with us are candidates from the 10th Ward in, alph in alphabetical order by last name. Today, we have Yesenia Careon, Peter Chico, Ana Guajardo, Oscar Sanchez, and Jessica Venegas. And today, we have Robert Strong from the Coalition from, a, from a South Works CBA, who will be our timekeeper. Robert, can you stand up? Give him a round of applause. The Thank you. Every candidate will be given one and a half minutes to answer each question after it's read. May I repeat, when you go over one and a half minutes, the microphone will be turned off. The questions being asked were put together by the organization sponsoring the event, which reflects the communities they represent. Before we begin our questions, each candidate will have one minute to introduce themselves. First up, Yesenia Careon. Hi, my name is Yesenia Carrion. I am a lifelong resident of the Southeast Side. Um, uh, in 2010, my husband and I purchased our first home on the East Side where we now raise our uh, eight-year-old twins. In 2006, I had the opportunity to work for former Alderman John A. Pope, which is where I got introduced to the Aldermanic Office, the uh, craziness that is that office because I didn't realize how much goes on there. Um, I was able to learn hands-on what uh, happens in City Hall, how to work with City Hall, and, how, um, and community engagement. I really uh, grew a passion for community work, uh, working in that office. After that, I worked um, with the Sasha Gal Chamber of Commerce, as well as have served on boards as like the Metropolitan Family Service, the Eastside Little League, 
Um, recently, during the pandemic, I was able to join the Calumet Area Industrial Commission team, um, helping with the contact tracing and the community health and response coordinator, uh, servicing our neighborhood and our community. While the whole city was shut down, we were out making sure that our communities were vaccinated, were receiving the resources that they needed, and advocating for our residents. Um, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Yesenia. Next is Peter Chico. Hello, my name is Peter Chico. I think it's important in electing an alderman to know that they have the experience of what it takes to be the alderman. So I graduated from college and undergrad uh, in political science. I have my master's from DePaul University in public service. And when I graduated from college, I made a commitment to myself. And that commitment was I wanted to help people. I didn't care who, I didn't care how, I just wanted to help. So after I graduated, I started at United Way, raising money and funds for communities and, and families in need. I transitioned into child welfare services to deal with at-risk youth. I worked in the children's shelter through Maryville Academy, and then I worked at Volunteers of America for 20 uh, DCFS families. After that, I got my career in law enforcement started. I did five and a half years at the Cook County Sheriff's Department. But at that moment in my life, I know I wanted to come back home and help people closest to me. I applied for the Chicago Police Department, and soon after, I found my way back to the 4th District, which encompasses most of the 10th Ward. And while working um, in the 4th District, I knew I needed to do more. I got, invo I got involved in the Hegwish Bulldogs. I'm on their board and the LSC at Washington. Hello, everyone. I'm Ana Guajardo. Originally from the Bush community, then moved to 91st Street, a few blocks away from Our Lady Guadalupe Church, where I did all my religious sacraments. Um, I, my father was a steel worker. My mother was a seamstress. She would also be a business owner, selling Avon products um, in the streets of commercial to several of our neighborhoods. Um, I co-founded Centro de Trabajadores Unidos, United Workers Center, 15 years ago when Jay's Potato Ship Company went bankrupt, laid out 400 union workers. And since then, I've been um, organizing in the community. I've also started a worker center, where I'm in the process of finishing a community center for the organization, where we're going to be housed on 9805 South Ewing, where we're going to be able to pro continue to provide services in our community. The work that I've done for the past 20 plus years from labor background has been to advocate and ensure that the voices of our community are heard. It is our job. As elected officials, it is our job as organizers to make sure that the people who are impacted by the issues are lifted. That's what I have done for the past 20 years, and that's what I hope to continue. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Next up, we have Oscar. Good afternoon, everybody. Can everybody hear me? All right. I can stand up. Can people still hear me? Good afternoon, my name is Oscar Sanchez and I'm running to be your next 10th Ward Alder person because I want to strengthen our community. Because we've been suffering and we are tired of the same political game where you put somebody in office and there's no accountability. We are suffering, we are tired, people feel abandoned. And that doesn't sit right with me. I can't stand by to see people suffering. I can't stand by to have youth calling me as an anti-violence coordinator and telling me, Oscar, I just saw my friend shot in front of me. Oscar, my parents don't can't pay these bills. Oscar, I'm scared. We deserve a community that loves us too, because that's why I'm running. I'm running for the people that love Chicago, but Chicago doesn't love them back. I'm running for the people that have hope in this community, that want to see it restored, that want to see it thrive. I want to make sure that every single one of us feels safe without any compromise. Thank you. Thank you, Oscar. And next up, we have Jessica Venegas. Hello, I am Jessica Venegas. I am running for 10th Ward Alderman because I grew up in this, in this community. I, myself and my husband are raising our four children in this community, and I want the 10th Ward to thrive again. I've been a police officer for 16 years, and I understand the issues that we, need to uh, that we need to resolve regarding public safety. I am a lawyer. I know how to navigate through the systems to advocate for what we need as a community. I want to bring programs back for our children so that, and our young adults so that they can understand their options in the future so we can deter them from choosing crime. 
We want them to go to college if they can, but we want them to know that they have other options like trade schools and technical schools. These are the kinds of things I want to implement in our community because I want to the, the 10th Ward to thrive. And I want to hear from my community so that I can address all of your concerns as well. Because as, I, as your next alderman, I believe that it is my job to be the voice for you. Together, we can make things happen. Thank you. Thank you, candidates, for your opening statements. Um, before we continue, we just want to remind folks if you could please hold your applause until the end, just for the sake of time, so we make sure that everybody has a chance to ask questions. Um, now we will have Kennedy Latrice from Clariton Associates read our first question on community safety. Kennedy? Last year in Chicago, there were 2,877 shootings, resulting in 638 deaths due to gun violence within the city limits. In South Chicago alone, there were a documented 67 shootings, which resulted in 18 deaths, which is a 64% increase from 2021. We will never be able to detain, police, or incarcerate our way out of this problem. There must be solutions that come from working with the community on various levels. What are some restorative practices and intervention initiatives such as community partnering for peace, a citywide street outreach program, safe passages initiated by Chicago Public Schools and Unity Squad, a youth development and leadership program that you personally have worked with or would bring to South Chicago should you be elected? And so, uh, with that question, we start with, oh, Mr. Pacheco. So, uh, being a police officer here, I've been at some of those incidents that, that you were naming. I've been at the shootings, I've been at murder scenes. And let me tell you a quick story that happened to me on Commercial Avenue on 87th. One day I was driving down the alley and I saw a young man walking in the alley and he had Bowen wrestling gear on. I stopped him because I just read an article of the previous week and and the article stated how good the Bowen wrestling program was. So I stopped him. I said, hey, what's going on? And he looked very proud to wear this uniform. I said, how are you guys doing? He goes, man, we're doing great. We're winning our matches. And I said, why are you in the alley? And he looked at me and he said, because I'm afraid to walk on the sidewalk on Commercial Avenue. And I said, I looked at myself and I said, that, that ain't good. And that's not right. Here's a young man who isn't in trouble and he wants to get in. He's, he belongs to something. He belongs to a team. And he wants to stay away from the violence. And we have to do better for our youth. We have to find our youth ways to, to be involved in the community. He was involved in the wrestling program. We need our youth to be involved in arts, other sports, music, because we owe it to them. We need to build community centers, have our schools open late and on the weekends, because it's imperative we give them something to do so they don't, so they don't stray off and do something else. It's important that we give not only our youth, but, but our extended family something. We need them to, we need to wrap our arms around them and give them something to do. Thank you. Repeat the question for several of us that did not read. The question is in regard to, and you can tell me if I'm saying it correctly, in regards to the violence and coming up with other solutions, not necessarily policing solutions, given other programming and other uh, strategies that have been developed already to address. Yeah. You. Thank you, Kennedy, for your testimony. There are several things that we need to do as a community. Um, I do want to um, commend um, and recognize the work that Clarition Associates and other organizations have been doing with violence prevention programs. I would love to see these programs also extended on the entire 10th Ward spread out. Um, I know that there's been some limitations in fundings for certain areas, but it would be great if we can ensure that these services are also provided to the rest of the wards. I definitely believe, Kennedy, we need more after-school programs for our youth, so our youth can be involved and participate instead of being on the streets. There's definitely more resources that need to be reallocated at the moment. The police funding is half of the budget from the police department goes to police. We need to make sure we reallocate those funds, that it goes to other services and programs that either nonprofits or other agencies can provide to ensure that public safety is prioritized. And getting the youth is extremely involved and from a, at this young age, 
Very important that we can also work with several of the schools to provide after school programs or bringing unions to do provide tradesmen's um, apprenticeship programs where they can begin to get involved because a lot of the violence that we also see in our communities is connected to the lack of jobs. We need to make sure that we also look at the other systematic issues that are affecting the crime issues that we have in our community and begin to solve those equally so we can make sure that we have enough involvement from our youth that people feel safe, that our seniors also feel safe walking down the streets. And as I mentioned before, we cannot allow for this open air drug market to continue in our streets and we need the police department to work with the community and ensure that there's safety in our community. Go ahead, Oscar. When it comes to the program we need, if we want to reduce gun violence by 50%, as we're seeing in studies, we need to have three approaches. We need to ensure we have community outreach and understand the needs of our community members alongside actually providing those services that they desperately need. Two is we need workforce development. We need to make sure that people have actual jobs, a livable wage. Because right now, in South Chicago, and even in the 10th Ward, 55% of our community members in the 10th Ward make less than $40,000 as a household. That's unacceptable. And three, we need to make sure we have more counseling. We need to make sure we take care of our mental health. We need to make sure we have treatment, not trauma, and ensuring that we have the services for our youth that are being traumatized by these shootings. When we talk to youth, they're telling us, I'm scared to go to my after-school program because then I'm out late. I'm scared to go grocery shopping. I'm scared to go outside. And I want you to imagine, what does it look differently to have fully funded schools, to have fully funded mental health clinics, to have fully funded parks, so we can spend time with our young ones as families and seniors? And most importantly, it's looking how we're having follow-up on these police orders when it comes to empowering communities for public safety. And I'm proud to be working with the Police District Council on this because we need to make sure we have follow-up on what's happening. Thank you. And finally, uh, Jessica. As I mentioned before, I believe that we need programs for our children and our young adults. I know we have some great communities, uh, community organizations that are providing programs for our children. I would advocate to make sure that they have enough funding and I would be working with them to develop programs. Again, we, our young adults need to know that they have options and they need programs that lead them and help them to believe in themselves, to believe that they have a future. They need to believe this so that they don't turn to crime thinking that that's their only option. We need the guidance, the, the paths for them. So these are the kinds of programs that I believe we need. I do believe we do need to work with the police department and, and have police presence within these communities, having the youth meet and work with the police department so that they can understand that the police are there for them. And that way they're not having some war against the police. This is something they need to work together. We need to teach our youth that they have a future. They can have a future, that it is possible for them. It's important to instill that in them at a very young age. And that's what I would love to see in these programs. And those are the types of things that I want to implement for our community that would help with the safety aspect and address the crime. And now to close, Yesenia. So in my previous years um, in the ward office, I had the opportunity to work with Claritian Associates on the Safe Passages, as well as with Asa and Amalia, we worked on a GRACE uh, program, which was a restorative justice program, which I am in full support of these kind of programs. I think you all are doing a great and amazing work, and I would love to continue funding these kind of programs that are already in place. Um, aside from that, I, as a partner of Our Neighborhood Times, we brought a program that was called Our Neighborhoods Got Talent, and it focused on young adults under the age of 18 uh, to showcase any kind of talent that they wanted to either, uh, that they had or wanted to just learn more about. So that slowly led into a, a presentation that they were able to work with Shakespeare in the Park. We, wor we worked with Shakespeare in the Park to make sure that they were able to showcase their talents on the stage, and it was a continuous thing that happened for years and years, and other neighborhoods 
took after that and were able to implement it in their areas. I want to continue doing programs like that. We did the murder mystery dinners. I'm a very huge advocate for the arts. So I want to continue bringing programs like that for our neighborhood, more performing arts, work with Sky Art. Um, you know, I've been part of, uh, I, I remember being part of the expansion of the Sky Art uh, program, which is amazing. Things like, those are the kind of programs we need to continue to, to um, to highlight and to, to fund. Also, I know you said besides policing, but I, I, I'm going back to we need to do the, the work together with the Eliana Task Force. Bring that Southeast Eliana Task Force where we're working with uh, multi-jurisdictional groups, with suburban police, the Indiana police, working together to combat the crime that's coming in and out of our uh, boundaries. Thank you very much. Um, before we move on to the next question, uh, quien está usando la traducción, quien está escuchando, si no tienen los audífonos, nosotros tenemos. Entonces, para que no estén escuchando del teléfono y tengan eh, los audífonos. Entonces, si alguien lo, necesita audífonos, levanta la mano, vayan allá, ¿a alguien. No, ok, solo para que sepan. For, ok, great. Um, next, I would like to introduce Berenice Padilla from CTU, the... Centro de Trabajadores Unidos. Bravo. <laughs> Thank you. The 10 word is the largest word in Chicago, and approximately 60% of us are immigrants. We are also known as the forgotten word and are largely unrepresented in Chicago in public sec sector jobs, higher education, and other indicators of social and economic security. We also know that the immigrant workers are that immigrant workers are the targets of racism, abuse, and illegal labor practices in many of our respective workplaces. This is why we, Centro de Trabajadores Unidos, United Workers Center, advocate for and work alongside our immigrant community to protect their collective labor and human rights, and therefore create better econ economic opportunities for all. On that note, CTU creates the South e created the Southeast worker-owned cooperative business incubator in 2014 to train members, many of whom are former low-wage workers, how to form and operate their own work-owned cooperative businesses. The goal of the incubator is to transform a current economy that suffers from high unemployment and poverty rates into a resilient and thriving community, guided by the values of democracy, solidarity, and mutual support. Now my question is, how can you support the efforts of United Workers Center, CTU, and its Southeast worker-owned cooperative business incubator in transforming the 10 word of Chicago into a resilient and thriving community where all residents have equal opportunities for economic security and dignity, regardless of their immigration or economic status? Thank you, Berenice. First, we will start with Ana Guajardo. Thank you, Berenice. Um, Berenice, um, as the former director of Centro de Trabajos Unidos, I actually started the incubator that we have in the organization where we are incubating worker co-ops. Let me tell you a little bit of history. In the state of Illinois, worker co-ops were not recognized. We had to go to Springfield to pass state legislation to make sure that worker co-ops can be recognized as legal business entities. As a result, we incubated two women-led businesses from the organization that are here in the community running, operating as businesses, and I'm grateful to know that three more businesses are on their way to be launched. What we can do, as we incubated co-ops, there were several things that we ran into. Many of our leaders who are launching these businesses and working together don't have the resources necessary to be able to launch. The Chicago Recovery, um, the Re Chicago Recovery Council, where I sit in, just passed 20 funds for 20 different groups, including CTU, to be able to receive funds to be able to incubate businesses. We need to make sure that these funds are also allocated to other parts of the community, to other businesses who are interested. So that's one thing we can do, make sure that there's city funds for these programs. There's also many other issues that a lot of these businesses um, run into, which is not having the resources or the capability, the, the skills to be able to operate. What we've done in the organization is make sure that we have those resources provided by our organization, by the incubator, that provide technical assistance to the co-ops, that provide for these businesses. We also need to make sure that there's incentives for these businesses and create an ecosystem here in the 10th Ward where several of these abandoned buildings, can, we can use some of the funds from the state to be able to operate and house our businesses here locally. There's several things that we can do if we just work together strategically. 
Thank you, Anna. Really quickly, I hold your applause, please. Also, um, if someone has a Honda outside, license plate V4438883, please go for your car before it is removed. Five minutes, a Honda, what color? We don't know. Gray Honda, license plate V, the Victoria 443883. Awesome, thank you so much. Yes, please make sure your car does not get towed. Um, and next we will have Oscar. Uh, could you repeat the question? Yes, um, so the question is, how can you support the efforts of the United Worker Center and its Southeast worker-owned cooperative business incubator in transforming the 10th Ward of Chicago into a resilient and thriving community where all residents have equal opportunities for economic security and dignity, regardless of their immigration or economic status? So I think that's the biggest question why we're here today is about what does economic development look like here? And it's really important that it's community owned. When it comes to many of these developments, it's always a developer coming here versus community ownership of projects because we need to develop community wealth. And that's the most important key to get us out of poverty. We have to be honest about the rate of poverty here. We always talk about crime increasing, but it's also talking about how poverty is increasing in our communities. And if we want to be able to transition and beautify our communities, we must support our communities by developing technical support. And that's really extremely important when it comes to co-ops. We can transform the 10th Ward into a thriving community and also be able to be give funding to each and every neighborhood to have be truly equally represented. And especially right now, more than ever, with the relatively available funds, we always talk about where are their funds. There's the Chicago Recovery Plan, which as of right now is $1 billion available to communities that we just need to be applying for. We also have the Climate Equity Jobs Act to ensure that we're putting money in the revolution of high paying jobs like solar panels, making sure we have a just transition of making sure people that haven't been part of these workforces before be part of them. We need to make sure we build up our community for these jobs. And on top of this, it's making sure that we allow this to happen. The most important part when it comes to co-ops is making sure that we continue funding them, continue supporting them, and ensuring at the end of the day that it's the community that's benefiting from them and not outside developers. Thank you, Oscar. Next, we will have Jessica. So one of the biggest ways that you want to support these organizations is is advocating for funding and ensuring that they have sufficient funding to address the, the issues that they are addressing with immigration. Um, I also believe that we want to uh, um, assist them with resources so they can check their immigration status and check their actual availability to, uh, to actually uh, get a legal status here. I'm not saying we're going to discriminate against them for their status, absolutely not. That's not going to be acceptable. We want to support them in every way that we can. Every program that we, uh, that we provide here, every, um, every, everything that we provide for the 10th Ward, I want to make sure that everybody's included, including our immigrant stat, uh, status, no matter what your status is. However, I do think that it's a good thing to assess where they stand so that we can help them to get legal status, find out where their status is, find out when they might be able to apply for the green card and find out when they may be able to apply for citizenship. Uh, those are important things that I think we need to look into as well so that they can get a good work visa and get better paying jobs as well. Uh, those are just some small ways that uh, I would want to uh, assist these programs, uh, but funding, absolutely. I would want to advocate and ensure that we have enough funding to support the programs. Thank you, Jessica. Next time we will have Yesenia. Um, I've always had a lot of support, uh, a lot of um, respect for the Centro de Trabajadores Unidos. I know the Aldermanic Office had a good relationship um, in the previous years, and I would continue to have that uh, great relationship with them. Being an advocate for um, programs like that and being a voice um, when, it, when it comes to City Hall or, or City Council, any, you know, in any way, um, just being a voice and make sure, making sure that they're getting the funds that they need for their programs. Also, working with um, their chambers, the local chambers, to have, provide free workshops 
as far as like bringing businesses and being business owners and and um, empowering them to be able to 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 find their their you know the, the, whatever whatever resource that they're looking for being able to to be a voice as far as our alderman's office and knowing that they have it's an open door and they they can come to us for any need that, um, that they're looking for. As far as uh, the chamber, we'd love to be able to do continuous workshops to help them start businesses. Um, again, with the mom and pop shops and the community businesses, that's the kind of, of area that we that we want here in the South Chicago area, as well as in the 10th Ward. Thank you, Yesenia. Next up, we have Peter Chico. In, in respect to CTU, I will not only advocate for them, but I will try to secure the funds necessary to continue the co-ops that, that's what this is about securing funding so they can continue to do what they do and a lot of it's about education we have to educate um the underrepresented because that is so important when it comes to them knowing their rights and what they're able to do and just to go a little further we want to we want to encompass everybody we want to bring everybody in so when, when it comes to funding and our commercial avenue we want to look at things like the neighborhood opportunity fund or the chicago recovery fund secure those dollars to to provide jobs on Commercial Avenue and, and to really once again resurrect it to what it once was. Thank you so much, candidates. How is everybody feeling? Good? Yeah, como se sienten todos? Yeah. Thank you so much to the organization so far that provided those really, really important questions about how we're going to create change in our community. Um, now we will move on to the next question from Elisa Escamilla from Family Rescue on gender-based violence. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Elisa. I am a domestic violence survivor from the 10th Ward. I lived in the 10th Ward during my 20-year marriage while I was raising my three children. I was also suffering from physical and emotional abuse at the hands of my husband. I made several attempts to leave, call the police, received orders of protection, and even stayed in a shelter. I never imagined that I'd find the strength to leave, but I did. And now I work as an advocate at Family Rescue, a domestic violence service organization where I assist women in leaving and finding safety in their own lives. While we, are, while we may not see it happening or hearing about it on the news, domestic violence is a serious problem in the 10th Ward. Uh, we experienced two domestic violence homicides last year. Family Rescue has served over 250 adult and child survivors last year in the South Chicago area alone. Unfortunately, we know there are many, many more out there. And so my question is, if you're elected, what will be your priority to address domestic and sexual violence in the ward? Thank you. And to begin these responses, we'll start with Oscar. For me, this topic is really important because at one point in my life, I was raised by a single mother who I had a father who was addicted to heroin and he left. And in the same cases, we need to have rapid responses when it comes to somebody stealing your identity because it omits you from being able to apply for housing, for any systems, any services. So we need to create legislation or ordinances that protects our women and allows them to have safety when it comes to child affordability, child care affordability, when it comes to housing affordability, and really ensuring that they have a pathway to ensure that they're safe to report and ensuring on top of this, their safety when it comes to having ordinances that if you are part of being a domestic violence abuser, that you cannot have a gun and you cannot be able to obtain a gun because we must keep our women safe. And it's, thank you. But on top of this, it's ensuring, again, these pathways. One of the things that we have to mention, and this is talking to community leaders like Celia Colon that does giving others dreams, is that the 10th Ward has some of the highest cases of domestic violence calls in the city of Chicago, and that's unacceptable. And then we must do the work to have the funding, but again, we must look at the root causes that we need financial independency. 
to make sure that women can feel safe to leave without having any types of abuse, regardless of viewing the signs. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Ika? No clapping, please. Yes, hold your applause. Thank you for the reminder, audience. One of the reasons why so many are not aware of all the domestic violence that happens is because it happens in the privacy of people's homes. What I want to do, what my priority is, ensuring that victims are aware of the resources that are available. They have orders of protection that they're allowed to get. They go to 555 West Harrison. Uh, these are things that we tell our victims when I'm on a job and I respond to a domestic uh, violence call. I'm constantly ensuring that the victims are aware of those resources. But on top of that, from the 10th Ward here, I want to make sure that they have advocates here because sometimes these victims don't have a way to get to the domestic violence building to go get those orders of protection. And I want to make sure that we have resources so that they can contact us, they can reach out to us, and we can help them through the process. They do have help at the domestic violence building, but if we can give them some further help directly from our community where we can drive them there, help them, and ensure them that, that we are going to be there with them every step of the way, I think that's important because we need to empower the victims to stand up against their abusers. That is the hardest part to do, is to stand up against your abuser because they knock you down verbally before they start to attack you physically and they start to lose your self-esteem. And I believe truly in actually helping each person and having them understand and make sure that they do have their own financial stability to stand on their own two feet. But we have to empower them. Thank you. Yesenia? One of the reasons why people don't speak up um, regarding domestic violence is because they feel financially tied down. Um, and it's, it's a way that, that, that their abuser keeps them down is by making sure that they're able to, that they cover them financially all the way around. Um, years ago, um, Neil Basenko, who may he rest in peace, started a, uh, 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 it was like a, a banking account or program where they were raising funds for people that had, that were in need or were like, where the houses were, there was a fire in their home. These were funds that they could allocate, you know, if, ne if needed and everything. So I would like to be able to start a program like that where there is funds going into a program where it is spe specifically for domestic violence uh, victims because when somebody is in need, it's like a, they decide then and there that they want to leave. They, that's what they need is the resources. So we want to make sure that they know that the resources are available. The Alderman's Office will provide those resources, um, start the, the grant program, and make sure that we work with our, our, our organizations in our area uh, to be able to, to, to serve as a, a startup for them. Uh, when they leave, when they decide that they're ready to leave, and and be there for them if they do decide to go back, and again, um, be a be a, a program for them for when they decide to leave, and 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 provide that assistance um, so they don't have to worry about that. Thank you, Peter Chico. So this is a very important issue, and what I mean by that is, in the fourth district, domestic violence, we have the highest domestic violence uh, rate in the whole city. The fourth district. Uh, has the, the most cases of domestic violence. So there's a lot of things we have to do. First, we have to partner with the, the Department of Public Health in addressing this very important issue. We have to approach it uh, in a way that's trauma-informed, with, with health equity, cultural responsiveness, and dismantling racist systems. It's all about education. We have to educate people on what exactly gender-based violence is. There's different types, physical, economic, emotional, sexual. That all needs to be drilled in to the community on what, what is going on. But most importantly, it's about connecting the victims to services, because that's what we're worried about here, whether it be legal services, rapid rehousing, financial assistance. We need to let them know they are not alone, wrap our arms, arms around them, and tell them that, that we will help them and, and, and move on in, in this journey. So that's what we need to do. Thank you. And finally, Anna. Elisa, thank you so much for your testimony. I think the first thing is acknowledging that we are in a domestic violence situation. And as mentioned, it's not just emotional, it's, not, it's physical, it's financial. There's so many con um, sectors connected to this. But acknowledging and be willing to receive support is important. We need to make sure we have 
resources available. We have family rescue here in our community. There's other agencies that could also receive funding. The police department does have a program that they started where they're receiving calls, but we have to also work with the police department to build trust because there's not enough trust at the moment with our community and they're afraid to make calls. But if we begin to build that trust, then that's one way of also ensuring that those people who are seeking help can receive the help that's needed. Um, and Elisa, you're not alone. There are several of us who have gone through this in one way or another, but the important thing is knowing that there are other people in our community who are willing to stand with you and others to ensure that they receive the appropriate services. And acknowledging that it's not just women, there are also men who also suffer from this. Mental health services are important for this. If we reallocate the funding that we have and ensure that we fund institutes that provide mental health services and let people know and get rid of that stigma that we have to not be able to reach out for services because then we're, we're categorized a certain way. And so there's several different sectors that we can take, tackle on, but it's really important, I think, again, to acknowledging that we need the support. And again, we're not alone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for those answers. Um, next, we have Luna Ariel, who is going to be, who is a, a business owner on Commercial Avenue with a question on small businesses. Good afternoon, or good evening. My name is Luna. I am the owner and operator of Luna's Enlightenment, LLC. I am a long-term resident of the 10th Ward. I came to South Chicago because I wanted to plant roots in a community where I felt like home. And must I say, this was one of the best decisions that I've made. I immediately got introduced to so many community organizations, other small business owners, and volunteers who share a vision of creating a thriving community. Having a support system is important for growth and development of my business as well as for myself as an individual. I am truly honored to have been accepted into a group where my ideas, talents, and words are valued. Current new developments on Commercial Avenue is focused on affordable housing and local hiring, but does not prioritize local businesses with affordable rental rates and does nothing to invest in existing locally owned businesses like mine. Instead of keeping money within the neighborhood and supporting the small businesses that have sustained Commercial Avenue, new development excludes local businesses due to the high cost of rent, priced at downtown rates, and will take money from the neighborhood by sending profits to north side companies while provoking even more South Chicago business closures. As an older person, what is your definition Investment and what will you do to address this issue in current development projects that exclude local businesses due to unaffordably high rents? Thank you. Sorry. And with that, um, we will start the question with Jessica. I believe our small businesses, our local businesses, are, are very important to our community. I, I believe in investing in them advocating and helping you to seek out any resources, funding that we can bring back to our community. We're, we are looking also to build more small businesses here. And that is unacceptable that the investments are going to other places. As your next alderman, I would be advocating to get those investments directly here to make sure that any that we have any funding comes directly to our small businesses and to assist new businesses and the current businesses so that they could stay here. I would be working with you. We can have meetings alongside with you and the other businesses to check what it is that you need to help your business grow and thrive. And I want to hear from you guys to see exactly what you guys need. So I believe wholeheartedly in our small businesses and I truly would want to invest directly back to them. Thank you. Thank you. Yesenia? So as a business major and a business owner myself, I am a huge supporter of economic development, and that's one of my main focuses on my platform. Um, small businesses is, is what 
this neighborhood used to be made of, uh, the South Chicago neighborhood, mom and pop shops. Um, I think we need to have a realistic vision and plan. Uh, in 2015, we did work on a revitalization plan with UIC that I believe is still there. Uh, I don't know, you know, like where, where it stands right now, but we could revisit that and, and work from there to see what continues working. As far as funds for small businesses, there are programs in right now available. Um, I think that it's a matter of educating the business owners and so they know that they can apply for those. So I know people have brought up the neighborhood um, improvement program or neighborhood opportunity funds. That's actually a, a residential program. The small business improvement program is for small businesses. And the problem that we faced though in the past, because again, this program goes on every, I think it's even open right now that you can apply for. But it's a matter of educating our business owners and knowing how to apply for those funds, how to qualify and that's the problem that we run into. So as an alderman's office, we will be a, a, a resource for that program and for people to be able to qualify for those programs, educate our community. I would love to be able to have quarterly workshops for people that want to open up a small business, get them started and uh, help them come up with a mission plan, a business plan, their application from the beginning to the, uh, to the groundbreaking. That's what, we, that's what I would like to be there for. Every quarter, I, I guarantee that if I were alderman, I will make sure to have that every quarter business workshops and work with the South Chicago Chambers and our business associations. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Peter Chico? Uh, I think, first of all, we have to welcome businesses and business owners. The city likes to put on that, that we're a welcoming city of businesses. I don't always feel like it's that way all the time. And Commercial Avenue is an economic opportunity zone, and that means there is a lot of money a lot of funds that are available if we just connect the businesses to, to the funds. And as Alderman, I will advocate for that. I will advocate that money comes from the Neighborhood Opportunity Fund. The other day I was looking, to, uh, 2021, 2022, I didn't see anything go to Commercial Avenue. That is wrong. That is wrong and that will stop because I will advocate for it. Next, when it comes to bringing in development, I was going over the SSA's numbers the other day. And when it comes to economic and business development, they spent zero dollars on that. Zero dollars on business and economic development. That is not right. That will change. We need to bring the money and put it where we need it, and that is development. Just really quickly, and then, um, para quienes están necesitando la traducción, hay un número nuevo, lo lamentamos. Creo que cambió el número, me lo acaban de dar. Um, son varios números, entonces yo no sé quién necesita traducción. Pueden levantar la mano y les doy este papel directamente. Entonces, quien necesita traducción, levanten la mano y les vamos a dar este papel. You can just see. Nobody? Nadie? Acá. Um, great. Okay. Uh, please, Ana. Yeah. Thank you, Luna, for your, for your testimony. Um, I think we first need to understand what is the need of each business owner. Um, every business owner has different needs, and it's important for us to walk through commercial, east side, Hegwish, to have a better understanding of what are the needs. Once we have a better understanding, one of the things that we've learned as we were incubating businesses, it's, it's how do we identify these resources? How do they apply? Yes, it's great we have Neighborhood Opportunity Fund, but if you don't have the people to help you do these grants, it's very difficult to receive these grants. We were not able to get the Neighborhood Opportunity Grant twice, but if you have resources allocated to you and that support, then that'll make it, that process easier. Another thing, if you walk down commercial, there's a lot of abandoned buildings. How do we get some funds to make sure that we can renovate these buildings and businesses here locally instead of having people go out locally if we can provide incentives to our businesses to be able to open up and receive the support that will help tremendously with lifting up the South Chicago area as well as other parts of the ward and then also we lost the South Chicago Chamber of Commerce how unfortunate what do we do as aldermanic and I hope that we are able to work with these businesses to get them together so they can open up a new South Chicago Chamber of Commerce you can't use the name, but be able to open up a new chamber of commerce here in the community to be able to support these businesses. Because I do also recall when Neil Basanko was supporting these businesses and making sure they were able to bring in those resources. Um, and more than anything, I would love to see how it was growing up here in the 80s and walking down Commercial Avenue and shopping here locally. We have to also educate our residents here, all of us, to be able to shop locally versus going outside of Indiana. Thank you. Great, and Oscar, to close. We have to be honest that we're being priced out 
We can't live here. We can't rent here. And we can't even dream here. I want you to, you don't have to answer, put your hand up, but how many of you thought about opening a business here? Opening a business in the 10th Ward. We have to look at affordable housing rates. Just to even think about this, it's determined by annual median income. The annual median income, that when I was here advocating when it came to Invest Southwest that the rents were too high, they determined it was $65,000 as the annual median income here. And that people could afford $1,625 to pay rent. Does that sound affordable to you? Thank you. When it comes to even renting here, it's about making sure community has ownership. We need community benefit agreements with these developers to ensure that when it comes to the retail space, that the community owns it. When it comes to these retail spaces, creating co-ops. We keep talking about co-ops, but it's making sure at the end of the day, the community profits. It's not just about the ownership of these stores, but the ownership, not, it's not about the employment about these stores, but it's also about who owns this. Because the owners of these stores get to give back money to the community. We have to be thinking about us owning South Chicago, us owning the 10th Ward, not developers, because where is that money going to go? The north side? The southeast side, the 10th Ward, deserves to have the economy that is circular, that we're benefiting from this and not being priced out. Thank you, candidates, um, and thank you, Luna, for your question. Now we will move on to a question from Mary Mercado from the Germano Millgate leadership team on housing and tenant rights. Oh, and the and a brief announcement again. Quienes están usando las traducciones, pónganse silencio, pónganse en mute, en mute eh, de, la, de su lado, porque si no, todo el sonido se cruce y, y no se puede entender. Entonces, quienes están usando las traducciones, eh, presionen el, el micrófono así para que se apague el micrófono, para que sigan, pueden escuchar, pero no corre su voz. Gracias. Hi, I'm Betty Mercado, and I've been living at Javon Milgate for 21 years. Yuck. We have had issues with hot water, a couple other things, plumbing, roaches, mice, you name it, we got it. Our biggest problem is mold. We have not done any repairs, and they just put a bandage on it, East Lake. We have one security during the day, and he can't handle all the shootings in the past three years. It's gotten worse. I call it the ghost town. Children do not go outside and play. This is the most you've seen parents take their children out to school, and that's it. We have uh, come up with a plan for East Lake, but they're not falling through to it. We have lost a lot of people, a lot of hard workers. We will like the city inspectors to tour our apartment and with the tenants. What will be our support to our rights as tenants? Make sure HUD accountable, hold the owner accountable for the repairs and keep us safe. I'm scared to leave my house. 10 days, go out one day, 10 days. That's my life. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. So just to clarify, the question is, will you bring in city, city inspectors and make sure HUD holds owners accountable for getting repairs done and keeping us safe? What will you do to support tenant rights and efforts to get repairs done? We're going to start first with Yesenia Careon. Absolutely, I would. I mean, we've done it in the past. I know, Mary, we've worked together uh, when we used to sit down with uh, e the, the residents in Germano Milgate with their issues that they had. Definitely, uh, we would sit down regularly as, an, as the alderman's office. I would sit down regularly with CHA, with East Lake, with, with HUD, make sure that the residents' um, concerns are being addressed. In the past, there was issues. I know that they had a bed bug issue, and, and they didn't want to bring out uh, somebody to clean up the, the area. We had to push and push and push, and we got that done. Um, they had a problem with all the trees that were that they were not being cut. They were causing people, easy people to come in and out of the fencing, cutting through the fencing. Um, there was a lot of crime taking place. We pushed and pushed and pushed and they got that done. So I would definitely make sure, make it a point to sit down with the residents um, and make sure that HUD and uh, Eastlake and CHA are being held accountable, sending the, the uh, inspectors just like we've done in the past. Thank you, Yesenia. Now we will move on to Peter Chico. 
So I was just in Germano Millgate um, a couple weeks ago during work, and what I saw there was uncleanliness, which is unacceptable. And we need to hold CHA accountable for that. If you remember about a week ago, the CHA chief was in front of the board, in front of the city council, and it was abysmal, the answers he was giving. It was unacceptable. So not only would I include Germano Millgate, but all Gale Gardens in this too, because what they have going on over there is unacceptable too. I will bring you guys in a room just like this, bring the CHA out here and address all the issues that need to be addressed. And furthermore, when it comes to security, they're not doing their job either. We try to meet with them. They, they haven't been willing to come to the table. Something needs to change there too. The shootings are out of control and it's just not conducive to live. Children need to, be, need to come outside and be able to play. And that is not happening and I agree with you. So when I'm Alderman, we're bringing them to the table and we're ensuring things will change. Thank you, Peter. We will move on to Ana Guajardo. The City of Department of Housing Commission estimates there are 100,000 units short of affordable rental units. We need to make sure that HUD, CHA are held accountable for these situations. Several things that need to take place. Um, we need to have these conversations with the local residents, see what their needs are. And if we need to be brokers and ha sit down and have conversations with them directly, I think that should be the role of the Aldermanic as well as some other organizations in the community that can provide that support. But it's important to have accountability with these agencies, but also with these um, developers and landlords. Another thing that is also important, there's a lot of land in our community. How do we ensure that we bring in development that's good, good housing? Many abandoned buildings here in the community, I believe there's 1,000 1, units um, available for affordable housing. How do we get the, the funding so we can make sure that community members are the ones who are purchasing these buildings and how do we provide them the assistance? There's so much that we can do to make sure that we avoid these situations, but accountability will be a priority and making sure that we can sit down with these landlords and with the residents is very key. Thank you, Anna. We will move on to Oscar. I think the important part is that we have to frame this as this is violence. People are going through violence in their own home. And that's not acceptable because literally your home should be somewhere where you feel comfortable, where you feel safe. But if you have your pipes frozen, if you have water for more than five days, where you don't even have your trash taken out for three weeks, these are problems that are happening in Germano Millgate, Harbor Point, All Girl Garden. It's happening throughout the 10th Ward and throughout this city. We need to talk about these issues. And that's why I support Bring Chicago Home that addresses housing insecurity in the city of Chicago, where we tax real estate over a million dollars, a tax to make sure we fund these initiatives. We can call it the problem for what it is, but let's fund it. And alongside all these abandoned buildings, 20% of the buildings in South Chicago are abandoned. We have literally houses available, so how are people facing housing insecurity? That is the importance about doing this job, is coming up with the questions, but what are the solutions? We need this funding. We need to hold these companies accountable, specifically the management company. People are suffering. I want you to think about, it's not just anybody living here, their families living here. There should be a lawsuit because it is insufferable what they're going through. And people deserve better. Again, we need real opportunity because for a long time, this investment destroys our communities. Thank you, Oscar. Next up, we have Jessica. As your next alderman, I will absolutely be reaching out to the city inspectors to ensure that they come out to do the inspections that they're required to do. And that requires diligence in calling and contacting them and working with the community at Germana Mills to make sure that we, we come to get together as a force so that they know that we mean business and we want them to hold them to be accountable for the way that, that they're living there. I also believe we need to make sure that we have the legal resources. I want to make sure that there's legal consultation so that the tenants understand what their rights are. And there may be lawsuits. And if that's the case, we will make sure that we have you connected to the right legal assistance to file for those lawsuits that are necessary because this is unacceptable for these children to be living this way, children growing up in these apartments. It's, it's just unacceptable, it's wrong, 
And I think, too, that we need to, with, with regards to the safety aspect, I, still, I do believe we need to work with the security, but I also still believe in the programs. I would want to make sure that the programs that we discussed earlier, that I discussed earlier, for the youth, the programs, the child care, those things are accessible to the residents at Germano Mills because that's what we need. We need to get these children, these young youth, young adults away from the crime. We need to get them away from choosing to sh shoot in the area, to, to go towards the wrong element. So those are the ways that I would advocate. Absolutely, hold the city inspectors accountable, make them come out and advocate to make sure that you have all the resources available to you as well. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you, Mary, for that important question. We know that housing is a human right and a right that all the 10th Ward members deserve. All right, ¿cómo se sienten todos? ¿Bien? ¿Bien? Yeah, how's everybody feeling? Candidates, how are you feeling? No pasa nada, todo está bien, ¿eh? <laughs> Okay, great. Now we will move on to the next question from Peggy Salazar from the Coalition for a Southworks CBA on Equitable Development. Peggy? Good evening, candidates. My name is Peggy Salazar, and I'm a lifelong resident of the 10th Ward that grew up in South Chicago. I have been involved in the community for many years in different capacities. Today, I represent the Coalition for a Southwark CBA and the Coalition of Concerned Neighbors. My question concerns equitable development. A simple definition of equitable development is an approach to meet the needs of underserved communities and individuals through projects, programs, and or policies that reduce disparities. I'm sure you are all aware of the city's current effort to revitalize South Chicago through the Invest Southwest initiative. South Chicago is no doubt an underserved community with its high unemployment rates and low income residents and where development projects could harmfully impact it with toxic development or displacement. Historically, Residents of communities like South Chicago have benefited little from revitalizing development. This is why a community benefits agreement defined by current residents to meet the needs of the community is so vital. Would you support the notion of a CBA for all developments and what policies and programs will you initiate to provide protections against gentrification? Great. Thank you, Peggy. Um, we're going to start with Peter Chico for this. So I would 100% uh, bring corporations and organizations to the table when it comes to CBA agreements. That needs to be done. There is no wiggle room there. There is no other plan. They will be coming to the table, and we will have a community benefits agreement. That's number one non-negotiable. Number two, when we talk about equity, we have to look at transportation. I think transportation is one of the biggest things when it comes to equity, especially on the south side. Um, we need to build around transit, uh, transit ways, whether it's train or bus. We need, to, we need to build housing around there and have economic development around there. Everybody doesn't have a car, and we need to understand that. So public transportation is one of the main ways for people to get to employment, to get food, to get uh, entertainment. That needs to be done. And that's one thing I will concentrate on uh, as alderman to make this more equitable and avoid gentrification. Thank you, Peter. Anna? Thank you, Peggy. We definitely, the 10th Ward is the largest ward in the city of Chicago. We have land, we have rail, we have water. It's important that we bring development that's good, that doesn't hurt us, that doesn't hurt our air, our water. We have the potential here in the 10th Ward to actually lift up businesses from community residents if we work with them in providing the resources that they need so they can start up. While it's great for outside developers to come and develop in our community, they should support a community benefits agreement. They should sit down with the community. But Let's take a different approach and create alternative economies like worker cooperatives where we're actually building businesses here locally from our people. 
with the resources that we can pull from the city of Chicago, from the state. So it's very important that as we, if we look at development, that we look at all aspects of development, and that we make sure that we have jobs in our community and that these jobs are local jobs. And if they need training, that we work, whether they're union jobs, with the unions to provide local jobs to our residents here. Workforce development is very important for our community, but making sure that we have the resources necessary and available for our residents is, is very instrumental. And one other thing about jobs, while it's great to have development and our jobs here in the community, let's make sure that they're livable jobs. $15 has been a great spike for an increase of minimum wage. We need to go higher than $15 as the economy continues to increase and it affects. And we need to make sure here in the city, of, in the Chicago land area, $400 million are stolen every year from wages from employers. Let's make sure that while we're bringing jobs, that those who currently have our jo the jobs here in our communities are receiving the pay that they deserve for the work that they're committing. Thank you. Oscar? When it comes to a community benefits agreement, I 100% agree, but we also have to do two things when it comes to it. One is if a developer doesn't abide by it, they have to be penalized, not a slap on the hand. It needs to hurt so they don't want to do this. Because when it comes to affordable housing, you have, when it comes to any development, you have to be, provide affordable housing. And if you don't, you're penalized. But that fee is so small. And that fee, we already, it already, gen, it already it's a revenue used, that fee is used as a revenue to fund more affordable housing. So it's a cycle. We don't need cycles. We need to address this and have actual solutions of penalizing and even having a city ordinance that CBAs are seen as a legal contract between communities and developers. Because what happens if it doesn't, when it comes to any development, especially here in the southeast side, we're taking advantage of. And because we have no opportunities here, no real economic opportunities, we're suffering. And we take anything. We shouldn't just settle for any development. We need development that's restorative. And for me, I always talk, and we don't talk about this enough, but our community went on a 30-day hunger strike to prevent a developer from coming here because the community didn't have a say in it. That's why community benefit agreements are important because our communities should be part of decisions that impact their lives. On top of this, it's about being innovative. When it comes to these developments, even when it comes to affordable housing, it's about how we're supporting artists, how we're supporting other types of venues. In Pullman, there's a blockhouse gallery that subsidizes rents for artists. Let's reimagine what development looks like. And let's make sure our communities at the forefront are the ones taking advantage of this and the ones benefiting from this. Thank you, Oscar. Jessica? I absolutely support the community benefits agreement. As a lawyer, that's uh, looking over contracts is exactly what I'm trained to do. And I would be making sure that I would be looking at these agreements word for word so that they're not trying to write in some type of sly uh, agreement and, and try to push, pull something out um, and take something from us when, and under the rules of trying to give us something. So those are things that I find important in reading the fine print of the contract word for word, understanding it, and understanding what our benefits are for our residents here in the 10th Ward. Absolutely, I agree with it. I would be fine-tuning it, looking through it carefully, ensuring that we do get the, the maximum benefits for our residents. As far as uh, fighting um, against uh, gentrification, one, I, one thought, and I've been you know, going over things, we want to make sure we employ our, our current residents. We want to make sure that they have benefits here. Uh, one thing that I would be uh, looking at researching is a possibility of a tax freeze. That is something uh, similar to rent control, which is if you have a business here, if you're a resident here, we well, would be looking to, to seek if we can have a tax freeze because one of the biggest problems when we have these gentrification situations is that the, the taxes start to increase because of our property increase. If we can keep our taxes where they're at because we're already here, I think that could be a, a big help for our residents to be able to remain here and not be pushed out of our neighborhood once it's improved. Thank you. And Yesenia? Yes, I'm, a, I'm in absolute support of CBAs. Um, I believe that uh, our chambers and our community residents and our uh, leaders in our community need to come together to be able to prioritize what these CBAs entail. Um, as far as gentrification problems. Um, I think that we need to look into possibly grandfathering in some of these business uh, uh, property owners that have been here from day one, um, as long as, you know, they, they meet the, the criteria and it's no slum, things like that. Um, also, uh, 
rent control and tax, uh, tax uh, holds like in New York, which they do the, the rent control, I think that when people uh, see that their taxes are not going up, that's going to incentivize them to stay in our community. Also, mm -hmm. gentrification happens because people feel that they, they cannot afford um, living there anymore. So in order to do that, we need to provide jobs for these people, for our residents. Uh, with the CBA, make sure that these businesses are truly invested in our neighborhood, are providing uh, temporary jobs as well as permanent jobs. But not only that, we need to make sure that we have programs in place to keep our, our community residents job ready because that's the problem as well. When we brought, when we were working with Ford, a lot of our residents were not job ready and we need to make sure that we are providing services as f even just from expungement to, um, to filling out a resume, to, to filling out an application, interviewing, little things like that. We need to make sure that our community residents are job ready for when these jobs come. Thank you. Um, just a reminder, if you have your questions, we'll be transitioning to the public question part soon. So index cards and little blue buckets. Um, moving on, we have a question from Yesenia Valcazar from the Southeast Environmental Task Force on Environment. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I'll quick announcement for the candidates. Um, unfortunately, we are falling a little bit behind on time. And so to make sure that we could get to the portion where community members can ask more questions, we're going to limit your time to answer the question to one minute. Robert? Perfect. Thank you. Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Yesenia Balcazar. I am the Senior Resilient Community Planning Manager at the Southeast Environmental Task Force. I was born and raised in the 10th Ward, and I am proud to be part of a growing movement to the young people that are committed to environmental and climate justice on the southeast side of Chicago, a movement that led the city of Chicago to deny the permit for General Iron. Given that every level of government and the agencies that were supposed to protect the 10th Ward have not done so, and we now lead the city of Chicago in the highest instances of COPD and heart disease as a result, what are you prepared to do if elected alder person of the 10th Ward to champion policies such as the cumulative impacts ordinance and a building performance standard to guarantee that the quality of life of all 10th Ward residents is improved? Thank you, Yesenia. Candidates, remember you have one minute and we will start with Ana Guajardo. Thank you, Yesenia, for your question. Um, a few things. One is to get definitely community involvement. Um, you know, I, I congratulate the folks that did the work on General Iron. I know that our organization, CTU, was also involved supporting it. And I commend those who took the actual lead in making sure that um, that was held up. Again, community involvement is very important. Education. How do we educate our community residents throughout the entire 10th Ward? Because it's not just the South Chicago area that's affected. Algar Gardens is also a community that's being affected by the environmental issues. So if we continue to do our outreach and inform every resident about the impacts of these environmental ha impacts has on them, it's extremely important. How do we work in coming together, bringing together the residents and the stakeholders who are probably contributing to this environmental in, um, factors. So as other woman, one thing that I've done in the past, I've committed to bringing together the key stakeholders who are involved to ensuring that the decision makings that are being made are being done collectively so we don't continue to hurt and uh, impact our community residents. So that's one thing that I will commit to doing, making sure that we can broker these conversations and have the stakeholders together. Thank you, Anna. Next, we will go on to, uh, to Oscar. We need to show we have frontline protections. We have the highest case of cancer and respiratory issues with one of the lowest air qualities in the state of Illinois. A community impact ordinance takes into account the full picture of the burden of pollution and industrial heavy industry operations here in the 10th Ward. That, that's the picture. It's about having frontline protections when it comes to our health. We literally have asthma vans going to elementary schools We've normalized it, but that's not normal. I've been to Newark, New Jersey, where they just had this. We need to make sure we have a Department of Environment to also hold these types of legislations accountable. On top of this, it's ensuring that we create a process to make sure that these companies, when they fail us, that they're penalized at a high rate so they don't continue doing this. General Iron, they violated ways in Lincoln Park, and they got 
slapped on the hand, and then that area got 1.6 billion in subsidies. What does that look like for us? At the end of the day, we need to make sure we actually are benefiting from this when it comes to all these performances. And at the end of the day, oh, well, thank you. Thank you, Oscar. <laughs> Next, we will have uh, Jessica. We need to work with EAP to implement policies for any new development that's coming to our community. We also need to work with them and ensure that any of our, any current businesses that are adding to the current pollution has to be fixed. We have issues also in our schools and those things, those, uh, the air, the breathing, the air that's being breathed in the schools is, is not healthy for our children. Things like that need to be fixed. We need to work with EAP for those situations. The current businesses need to be fixed and improved so that they are not polluting our air. And any new development needs to follow guidelines if they want to come here and develop here. We need to make sure that they follow the guidelines and make sure that they are held accountable for, for failing to follow any of the guidelines. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Next, we will have Yesenia. Um, so one of the things that we need to do is I would advocate for the city to bring back the Department of Environment. Um, this department is very necessary um, as far, especially uh, when we're talking about rules and regulations and um, the contamination of our air and these businesses. Another thing is I will make sure that the Alderman's office receives and gets any and all permits um, and zoning applications firsthand uh, because this is how we're going to stop them from the beginning if it's a, a business that we do not want coming in. And when I say we, it's we're going to sit down with other business owners, leaders in our community, and our community residents, and make sure that any business coming in and applying for these zoning applications um, and business applications are businesses that we all want to come in here and that are not businesses that are putting our health at risk, because we're not going to take that anymore. Thank you. And next. Peter Chico. So last week we were, we were in All Gale Gardens, and that's where environmental uh, justice was born through the Johnson family and them uh, standing up to the environmental hazards that the All Gale Gardens faced. I agree with you, Senia. We need to re implement the Department of, of Environment because we have too much issues going on. It was wrong for the mayor's office to get rid of it, and that was 10 years ago, I believe. They need to reinstate it because, especially for us down here, the issues we have needs to make it to the mayor's office. Number two, we've been a sacrifice zone for so long, and a cumulative impact ordinance is just what we need when it comes to uh, looking at the entire cumulative effect that a business might bring to the 10th Ward, not just one particular business. And we need federal tax dollars uh, to, 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 to take advantage of the grants that we could bring in not only the businesses but the community alike to hold them accountable. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. Now we will move on to the next question from Maria Sebastian from the Southeast, Southeast Youth Alliance on Youth and Education. <laughs> Good evening, my name is Maria Sebastian and I'm a sophomore at George Washington High School. Um, I'm not sure if you're all aware, but last year in June there was an incident where the second floor ceiling fell and it hit one of the security guards at, at our school. And this isn't the only problem we have at my school. There's a bunch of different problems. Uh, such as uh, us breathing in asbestos because our building is so old, not having clean water or like access to clean water all over the building. And we also have like bad plumbing and these are all just issues we face and there's more and it's not just us at the high school it's George Washington elementary school that are facing I heard worse even worse in the high school and th those are younger kids and us uh, teenagers and young adults and I can't imagine how they're suffering with all of that how they're handling and may they, maybe they don't have a voice to speak up that's why I want I'm here to speak up for all of us and I know for me, another problem that I faced was not having an English teacher. I haven't had an English teacher for an entire semester, and I'm not sure if I'm going to have one this semester. I know that uh, George Washington and George Washington Elementary School are not the only schools that are dealing with the overcrowding. So um, my question is, 
Both George Washington High School and George Washington Elementary School buildings are overcrowded and have outdated facilities that are literally crumbling. What will your commitment as older person to secure improved learning conditions for students like myself and school staff once you are in office? And we will begin with Oscar. Last year when the ceiling collapsed, the context is that it was the last day of school and it fell on a security guard. But imagine if that was during a passing period where in overcrowded school, I want you to think about that. And if that was a housing project or if that was any type of residential rental property, how the city would have acted if a ceiling was caving in and if the Bestos was in that building, it would have shut it down and mandated repairs then and there. But what happened? Nothing. Even two weeks ago, George Washington Elementary School, one of their annex buildings, the roof fell down. And they repaired it that same day, and later that day, it fell apart. So my commitment was when I joined the local school council, I created the Green New Schools Committee. And right now we met with our center to ensure the state funding. And alongside this, it's not just George Washington High School, elementary school. We need a formal process for any school to receive the repair and maintenance they need to thrive. Because there's no formal process. And we deserve one. Jessica? Sure. Um, you need to, so the question is, will be your commitment as older person to secure and improve learning conditions for students like herself and school staff once in office? Well, as an alderman, I would be working with the local school council and the community to ensure and, and programs that groups, organizations that are already advocating for the new facilities. I believe we need to search the area. As we've been saying, we have a lot of land in the 10th Ward. If it's time for a new school, we need to look into that option and start looking where we can start building so that we can advocate and we can present it to the city and say to the city, look, we have this land here. This is available. We need a new school. We need two new schools. Let's get it done. But I would be working with the LSE, with the community, helping them, guide them through the process of advocating for these new facilities. Washington is not the only the only schools, the two only schools that have this issue. Grissom and Clay also have these issues. I would be working with their community members as well and any other uh, communities for any of the other schools that need new facilities so that we can fight together to get the city to give us what we need for our schools. Thank you. Yes, Annie? As a CPS student, and my kids are CPS students, this is definitely a um, very... Um, huge topic for me and I will make sure as alderman to fight to, uh, to get fully funded um, to get our schools fully funded um, in our when I used to work for Alderman Pope we were we were we fought for a new Sullivan school when it was needed we fought for the annex um, for Marsh uh, when that was needed uh, when there was problems uh, issues with the um, with Galisto and the population issue we fought for the new school that's the new Sadlowski school. So I will make sure to continue fighting and advocating for funding and for a new school if needed. Um, I'm looking forward to the 2025, as you, as you may or may not know, it's going to be a partial uh, appointed and elected, uh, uh, elected student board. So, board, so in 2027 it's gonna be fully elected. So I believe that that's gonna be a great benefit to have a school board that's fully elected uh, because that way we can advocate for our own communities, our own needs, and we'll get the, the uh, local representation that is needed to get these schools funded. Thank you. Peter Chico. So like I said earlier, I've been in the LSC at Washington High School for the last four years. And I remember when the ceiling caved in last year, I was sent the pictures and I was appalled. I was appalled because this doesn't happen on the north side, but because it happened on the southeast side, we're just supposed to accept it and forget about it. No, we, we as a board signed a resolution for a new school at Washington. It was presented to the Board of Ed. I'm not sure it got very far, but as Alderman, I will tell you that resolution will be taken seriously by the Board of Ed and we will get a new school. And when it comes to overcrowding, you see these mobile units popping up all the time. Some schools have two, three of them. That's unacceptable. unacceptable. That's not conducive to learning for the students or the teachers. That needs to stop. Chris Southern Hegwish, they reached out to me. They want to annex. Um, 
Krista McClay share one school building. It's unheard of. Two schools sharing one building, that is unacceptable. When I'm alderman, I will work to bring money to the schools in the 10th Ward. Thank you. And Anna? Thank you for your testimony. We, public funding for schools is instrumental for our communities and our children's education. It's important for us, yes, to get involved in LLCs, but more importantly, to hold city council accountable to invest in our communities locally. It is not right for community schools in the north side to receive more funding than our schools. And while we're involved in the LLC um, local school councils, there's also so much we can do. But more importantly, it's important to get involved parents and students to lift up their voices. George Washington Elementary School was created only to last 10 years. It's been in existence for over 40 years. We need to build a new school, elementary school, and a new high school, but also to deal with the issue of overcrowding, find solutions and fundings that will eliminate that. In Hegwish, Grissom has a classroom size of 43 students, that is not acceptable. How are our children's education going to be taken seriously? So reinvesting instead of disinvesting is in our communities is what's important for us. Thank you, candidates. Now we'll move into the open floor part of the forum where we're here, where we're here questions from folks in the audience and also people who are on Zoom. Um, for those participating online, please put your questions in the chat and we will collect them. Candidates, you will have 45 seconds to answer each question, and I'm now going to invite Angela back to read off those questions. Thank you. All right, so we really want to thank everyone who submitted questions. We had quite a number of questions, so we have blended some of these questions together. Um, there were a, an enormous amount of questions about safety. People are concerned about open-air drug markets, about gangs, about guns. Kids are concerned about being able to take transportation just to school safely. So we would like to hear specifically what your stance is on providing safety should you become alderman. And we will start with, I believe it's, we will start with Jessica. Well, we need to, in order to address public safety, we do need to advocate, I plan to advocate to have policies implemented that allow our police to effectively do their job. I also want to advocate to make sure that we do have police presence. But I also want to make sure that I work with the police department so that the police department can work with the community and understand each other and understand what each other's concerns are. And I, I do believe, too, that one of, our biggest issue, one of our big issues is mental health. We need to uh, reestablish mental health facilities so that we can address the, the drug addictions, the, the alcohol addictions, the, the, the people that aren't able to secure jobs because of their addiction. So we want and any other mental health uh, issues that they have. Those are two avenues, big avenues, that I would like to uh, utilize to address public safety. Thank you, Jessica. Now we have Yesenia. Um, First and foremost, I would like to be able to hire and fully uh, staff our police. Uh, I think that we also need to assign an allocated police to hire crime areas. There's no reason why areas in the north side get more police officers than we do here in our area when we have higher crime. Um, as far as like the funding, where they come from, I think that we need to look into possibly uh, uh, raising the retirement age of police officers to retain experienced officers who would otherwise have been forced to uh, retire, um, and that could be temporary temporarily funded until we find another solution. Um, as far as here in the South Chicago area, there is an SSA number five that right now is getting about $500,000 a year, I believe. Uh, we need to look at to see where those funds are going right now and possibly starting to put them back into where they used to go. We used to have a, a security firm that used to go down the Commercial Avenue District. We need to revisit that. Thank you, Yesenia. Peter? We need to take a long-term and short-term approach to this. The long-term, keep our high schools open after hours and on the weekends to give our students and families something to do, connecting them to services immediately, short term. We are 50 officers short in the 4th District. That's 50 officers off the street. That's a lot. That's a ton. We need to ensure that mental health calls are being uh, done by alternative response to free up our officers. We need to have the plain clothes officers uh, man 10th Ward Beach so that provides an extra layer of presence. We need to place cameras in specific areas to try to curb down the violence. And most important, 
we sit in a geographical uh, disaster when it comes to bordering Indiana. We need to build our relationship with the outside municipalities to hold people accountable that commit a crime here and jump the border. Thank you, Peter. Anna? We need to hire, that back in the day in the 80s where we had the B cops, we need to make sure that we have police officers that walk our district, business districts, and build relationships, not just with the business owners, but with community residents. We have to build the trust to ensure that people feel safe to call the police office, officers. This open air drug market happening in commercial needs to stop. We need to ensure that the police department has the resources that they ha need in order to make sure that they're able to stop this drug dealing that continues to happen in our communities. We need to inc um, hire more detectives to reduce the clearance rate. A lot of reports that have been made have not been resolved because there's not enough police officers to re be able to respond to these reports. CPD has the funding. They get more than half of the budget from city from the city budget goes to police. Let's make sure we alloc reallocate those funds, that they're able to use those Thank funds. You, um, before we go on to Oscar, we have a tow warning. If you have a car, uh, it looks like a gray car, that has the license plate, M-Z-B-O-S-S-R. Please move your car, it is about to be towed. Is that mine? No. <laughs> It's by the gate. All right, thank you. I'm sorry, Oscar? I think that car might be mine. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so for me, when it comes to safety, we have to, we talk and we always hear on the news that crime is going up, but we have to be honest as well that poverty is going up. People are working more than one job just to make ends meet. We need real economic opportunity here, workforce development. We need to go and do outreach to our community members to say, what are your needs, a community needs assessment. Alongside this, we need to make sure we have treatment, not trauma, ensuring that we can have mental health services because suicide rates are going up. That is unacceptable. Our youth are literally committing suicide. One of our family members passed away last year doing to kill himself, a 14-year-old. That's sad. And alongside this, and making sure that policing is not the only answer. We need to make sure we have departments like a department of gun violence, making sure we're using other departments Thank you, as Oscar. well. You guys are doing very well. 45 seconds. I know it's not a lot of time. The next question is about gentrification. Gentrification is closer than ever. What can you do to ensure that not only long-term residents, but our next generation of residents will not be displaced? Now we're gonna start with Yesenia. Um, really quick, going back to what I already mentioned, looking at the possibility possible tax freezes like they do in New York. Uh, but the main thing I think that we need to look at is, again, jobs for our residents and making sure that they can afford to live in in, um, in these homes. So make sure that they are ready. Uh, so we need to do job readiness programs. We need to make sure that they are hireable, uh, do, do expungement programs like we've done in the past, uh, do workshops where they do resume uh, building and interviewing. Those are the kind of things that we need to do to make sure that they can get high high paying jobs um, so they can continue living in in their in their homes thank you Peter I think there's a couple things we could do I think number one uh, cap the property tax that yeah, will stop uh, people from coming in and, and lowering your rent number two I think we need to support our, our housing market is is terrible we are 120,000 units short what do we need to do we need to support the ADU ordinance which includes coach houses, in-law apartments, basements, to make the housing market expandable and, and therefore uh, lower the odds of gentrification happening. I think the first thing we need to do is make sure, have intentional dialogue and not be afraid to use the word gentrification and acknowledge that it's been happening throughout the city of Chicago and that it may come in the near future. How do we come up with proactive solutions instead of being reactive when it hits us? Few things, jobs, very important to make sure that we have jobs local so people can be able to pay their rent, have affordable housing for folks to be able to stay here and continue to support our residents. I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought when I said that. Thank you. Oscar? When it comes to 10th Ward, it's about honestly dreaming here. 
I want you to really imagine yourself being young again and saying, would you still continue living here after you finished your college years or even after you finished high school? Where is the real economic opportunity? But I think that's something that we've all but led to, but it's really looking at how are we actually creating real opportunities for people to stay here? How are we creating affordable housing? How are we making sure we empower young entrepreneurs to be open their businesses here? When it comes to, at the end of the day, people wanting to prosper, people want to build their ideas here, but what are the support systems for it? What are the making sure at the end of the day that people are also able to have creativity here? My thing is this, I want to have a youth advisory alongside other advisories to make sure we're listening to our youth for what they dream of here. Because if they're not part of the planning, they're not part Thank of the you, existence Oscar. here. And Jessica? Well, as I mentioned before, we're looking into a tax freeze so that the re current residents are not pushed out of here because of the tax increases. I also want to make sure that some of the programs that I discussed earlier, the programs that allow ch uh, the young to know the, uh, their options besides college and trade schools and techni technical schools, I want to bring those back because those are good paying jobs. Those are high paying jobs that if we can get our kids, their youth into those jobs, that's going to be our future generation, getting them into that workforce where they are making better money. I also want to make sure that we actually work with the community so that they understand um, making sure that they're aware because unfortunately sometimes big companies come they try to buy out a resident we should we want to implement policies that allow that make some type of a, a, a boundary so that they can't just buy out some se poor senior that doesn't know any better and signs over a contract so I want to implement policies that restrict that so those are just some of the the ideas to uh, work on uh, against gentrification thank you this is the final question for the evening so I think something that was expressed through the community was just positive relationships with um, the police and those who are sent here to just help the community. What is your position on police brutality and how do you feel about the district council police accountability that has been put in place this year? We're going to start with Peter. Well, I think the district council is gonna hold the police department accountable. I think it's a good thing. I think it's thing, a thing that the police welcome. When it comes to police brutality, I can't, so I, I can't support it. What happened to Tyree Nichols was ridiculous. It was just unbelievable. That should never be happening. I am a police officer. I do not support police brutality. It is wrong, and I will defend it for as long as I can. There is nothing good about police brutality. There's nothing good about what happened in that situation in Memphis. Thank you, Anna. The Obama administration passed a consent decree. The city of Chicago signed a consent decree with the Department of Justice. We need to make sure that the police officers who conduct police brutality are held accountable. It is important for our safety as residents to feel that we can work with the police, but trust the police when they do their job effectively and not take advantage of their positions over our residents. Now, we need to make sure that our Superintendent Brown is also held accountable for the things, the decisions that they made in the department. So accountability is a must in the police department. Thank you. When it comes to accountability, we must really look at our approaches. We must look at police brutality and really look at ourselves and reflect what approaches will mitigate these types of occurrences. We need to look at de-escalation. We need to look at tactics where if it's a non-violent emergency, that people that are trained for non-violent de-escalation tactics are there like social workers. Because this is the solution. We need to also make sure when it comes to accountability, it's working with the police district council to have follow-up on these issues. Last year, for the past three years, we've lost over $200 million when it comes to police lawsuits in the city of Chicago. I want people to think about that number and think about how that could have gone to our communities to be implementing these types of tactics to have safety, but they're just giving in a lawsuit. We must reflect about what is going to actually happen here. Jessica? As a police officer, I am appalled by any police brutality. I do not agree with any of those types of behaviors by police officers or anyone else. I believe in accountability to those officers who do uh, engage in police brutality. At, throughout the department, we are required to uh, attend training. They have started to implement policies to have us uh, respond to calls in a more uh, de-escalation uh, type 
um, for non-emergency, non-violent um, calls. I agree with that because I think that that is how we should be out there. I treat anybody that I come across like I want my family to be treated, and that's how I believe all police officers should be doing that. So I absolutely believe they need to be accountable because they make it harder for the good police to do our job properly. Thank you. Yesenia? Yeah, I mean, I agree with what everyone has said. Um, I think that um, I am full support of accountability and holding our police officers accountable for any kind of uh, treatment or actions um, that took place like the, in the Tyree Nichols situation was very, very uh, heartbreaking. So, I mean, I think it's, it, it, everybody here agrees with that absolutely needs to be done. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, we have one last question to wrap everything up, and this leads me to introduce Sam Corona from ASE, local development organizer, to ask this closing question. Thank you very much. Um, one announcement before I ask this question. Please, everybody, after this, um, remain, because um, we are having a raffle. Um, Clarations is having a raffle, and we want to make sure that you stay here so that you can win something, all right? All right, um, now let me get back to my question. Um, so candidates, um, and yes or no, um, will you, if you're elected, within the first 30 days of your administration, agree to meet with every one of the organizations that has uh, put together this form? Thank you. Yes or no? Absolutely. I think it's important, absolutely. Yes. 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 Thank you, everyone, absolutely. and... Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the candidates, and thank you to everybody who showed up today um, and who provided testimony and questions. These are issues of concern to all of us, and we appreciate your responses. We will now move to closing remarks from all of you. You have one minute. May I remind you, please be respectful to all the other candidates, and we will start with closing remarks from Peter Chico. Well, first of all, I want to thank everybody for all the sponsors for throwing this on. It, it's really a great thing, and thank you for that. And I want to thank everybody in the audience. It shows how much you care about this war. It shows how much you care about the issues in this war. So thank you for being here as well. I grew up not too far from here on 85th in exchange. And my, my parents are here. My two loving parents are here. I love this war more than anything else. And I'm sure everybody up here loves this war more than anything else. I want nothing more to become your next alderman. When it was time to buy a house, I bought a house here. When it, was time, when it came time to work, I decided to work here. When it came time to volunteer, I decided to volunteer here. I want nothing more than to live here for the rest of my life because I love it here. My family roots are here, my friends are here, and the best moments of my life have been here. So I want nothing more than to pass that on to the next generation for my kids or my friends' kids to have the best moments of their life here. So thank you for being here. Thank you for this event. Thank you, Peter. We will now move on to Ana Guajardo. I am the daughter, I'm the proud daughter of immigrant parents that came to this Southside community to be able to form a family and raise their children. I grew up a few blocks away from here. I remember the 80s being a vibrant community here in the Southeast Side where we walk without fear, where we talk to our neighbors, where we were not discriminated. I have experienced discrimination and was called several names for being brown. That is why we started Centro de Trabajadores Unidos United Workers Center to make sure that the voices of those who are marginalized and impacted by these issues are lifted. As an organization that has been advocating for worker rights issues in the past 20 years through my organizing experience, it is important that we lift up the voices of those who are impacted in our community. And as elected officials, it is not our job to be the voice for the community. It is our job to ensure that the voices of our community are heard. I believe in investment, not in disinvestment. We need to take proactive solutions, not be reactive. And as your next elder woman, I will commit to working with the community and ensuring that we work collectively to lift up our community as it once was. Thank you. Thank you, Gracias. Ana. Thank you, Ana. We will now move on to Oscar Sanchez. If you could please hold your applause. My name is Oscar Sanchez, and I'm running to be your next 10th World Order person because like you, I'm tired. I'm exhausted to see that we elect somebody and what happens afterwards. 
And let's be very clear when it comes to General Iron. I went on a 30-day hunger strike because our community was literally getting garbage and treated like a dumping site. And we had our local older woman working against us and even giving permitting promises to these developers. What happens when it comes to our health? What happens when it comes to our dreams? What happens when it comes to us being able to say that the 10th Ward is prosperous? For me, I'm running because I want to see my community be fruitful, be able to have investments, but not displacements. So you would have know that the violence that we're facing is not our fault, but it's systemic. And be honest about this. We have to address the crime, yes, but we also have to address the poverty here. So for me, I'm running because I see each and every single one of you as people, as our neighbors, as people that we need to work together to get a safe, healthy, thriving community that includes all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Officer. Thank you. We will now move on to Jessica Venegas. Thank you. I'm running for alderman because I believe in the 10th Ward and I believe in its ability to become the economically competitive so that we can have a thriving community no matter what your background is, age, race, gender, gender choices. I believe that we all have the right to thrive here in our 10th Ward community. I believe that as a police officer of 16 years, as an attorney, as a mother of four children I'm raising here with my husband, I believe that I have the background that can lead us into the thriving community that we can once again be. We need your help, though. I need your help to get there. I want to be the representative, your voice, for you. But I need you to start by getting to those polls and voting by February 28th and making sure that we start having your voice heard right there and then. Punch 52 for Venegas so that I can be the voice for you. Thank you, Jessica. We will now hear... We will now hear your closing remarks from Yesenia Careon. Hi, um, I'm running for alderman because I believe that it is time uh, to make, we need a change. We need a change here in the community. And the one thing that I can offer you is experience. Experience and know that I am ready to work day one. You will not have to wait for me to, to learn the ropes. You will not need to learn, wait for me to figure out what I need to do or how to work with City Hall. I've already done that. I've already brought businesses to our community. I've already brought schools to our, to our neighborhood. I've already worked with the Ileana Task Force to help combat the, the uh, safety issues that we have in our community. I've done it already, and I'm ready to continue doing it. This is the reason why I'm running. I, my, my children are here, and I plan to live here for the rest of my life and hopefully for the rest of my kids' lives. You know, I do not want to move out of here. And I have a passion for, for this area, and I, I've been here for the past 20 years, did not disappear, did not go anywhere, did not just come from day one randomly and said, I want to run. No, I've been here, and I will continue to be here. No matter what happens, I will continue to work for this community. But if you want changes done, if you want improvements, if you want economic development, you need to vote yes. Punch 54 on February 28th. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. Thank you. We want to remind everybody to vote no later than February 28th for the city elections. And you can also vote early. You can register to vote on the same day that you vote. Um, the blue sheet, which is the one that I'm holding here that you guys can also collect at the table if you don't already have it. The blue sheet has information on voting, where, where to find your polling place, and general information about candidates. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. We might have some more announcements, um, but thank you. Yes, thank you, everyone. And another thing you might have in your packet are, is this. We're asking everyone if you're interested to scan because we are trying to get lead testing pipes, uh, lead testing for our water and filters. So if you're interested in it, it's in a little packet. If you didn't get a little blue packet, let me know and let's get clean water for all of us. Thank you again for coming out. Thank you to the candidates. You've been a wonderful audience and applause. Thank you very much. And now we will go to the raffle. Hey everyone, when you all entered the building, you had a survey sheet. We ask that you all fill out that survey so you can enter into this raffle. It, have y'all completed the survey?
Okay, we finna do the raffle. The raffle is for Palatine.